Hello and welcome to Allison's Guide to Overcomplicating Would-Be Routine Tasks. My name is Allison and I'll be your chaperone as today we will build a fence. Grab a drink, sit back and relax as we do a lot of unnecessary but ultimately rewarding work. This intro bit could be an entire video but that'd be really boring because I didn't film it. Didn't realize I wanted to. Anyway, to avoid that we're going to start with a speed round. Go! Our friends the McCarrick live in this, well, this 1911 Victorian Revival style semi-detached home. My mom and I kept noticing the sagging of the roof and deck lines and the displacement of this quarter. Mom and McCarrick said we could take a close look. We pulled up decking in two locations and found rot throughout the structure, which was supported, su 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 supported, 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 by eroded and collapsing brick piers. In our borough, you can get fined a thousand dollars a day for working without a permit, even if you are temporarily supporting a potentially unsafe structure. So I didn't really have anything to do but to get to work on permitting paperwork immediately. In general, historic permits are only approved when you're proposing replacement of deteriorated materials to match existing. Basically, revision boards are trying to ensure that a renovation doesn't remove community history. So I drew the structure and I marked elements to be replaced in kind, though I did make a couple of slight non-visible changes to improve the structure long term. Due to the fact that I am not yet licensed, I had a family friend, an architect David Schrader of the Schrader Group, and one of his engineers review my drawings. They suggested a couple of changes and clarifications, including installing a fence around the porch perimeter, which were made. The drawings were signed and we were off. We submitted, were approved, and got to work. There was a weekend full of demo. We temporarily supported the roof. My uncle was a big help in this. He's great at the art of destruction, structural repairs, and passing that knowledge onwards to the future generations. The boys dug out holes for the new concrete piers. I made forms. The mom stripped wood columns. An inspector came to review the concrete forms. We passed. Dad and Sean mixed and poured the concrete. I spliced and repaired the base of the wood columns. The moms repointed the field stone of the foundation of the house because the mortar had turned into dust. Literally, instead of using a chisel or a chipping gun to do demo, we used a vacuum. The mom strips columns? I can't think of a way to say it that doesn't sound like a euphemism. The moms and I kept on stripping on weeknights to prep for the upcoming weekend. They also wet sanded and painted the columns. Mark was back. We removed the concrete forms. We filled the surrounding area with earth. We cut the excess wood off the base of the columns and installed them. We attached the deck structure to the column and piers. We anchored the deck structure to the base of the house. An inspector came to review the structure we passed. I think it was around this time Mama McCarrick and I decided on a whim that it didn't make sense to leave this old fencing next to the beautifully repaired woodwork, so we removed the old Victorian fencing and non-structural center post for restoration. We also picked paint colors based on the late Victorian era and the red and white of the house, added this pretty little lattice work beneath the deck, and installed decking. <sighs> Time-wise, I think that's about as good as we could have hoped for. Now, we are actually up to date. You know what? Let's take you back again. Remember when I said this? They suggested a couple of changes and clarifications, including installing a fence around the porch perimeter. At the time, this seemed a fairly easy concession considering a free review and signature. I had actually convinced myself that I would go to the store, buy whatever fencing was cheap and available, and just install it. <laughs> good joke. I don't know why I thought I could do that, but we're all mad here, I know that. Anyway, my mom and I had the same idea, and then there was no one around to convince us that we shouldn't design and build it ourselves. Yep, and that's why there's a video. To design the new fencing pieces, I took inspiration and dimensions from the original fence that separated the two properties. The original fencing was constructed in three parts. There was a horizontal T-shaped bottom rail with a channel on the top of it. Sawn cut balusters in the Lancaster style sat within this channel. Finally, the top rail has a curved profile with a similar channel to the bottom rail, which sits on top of the balusters. The fence was anchored to the building with the top and bottom rails, which were nailed into the posts. To recreate this style, we bought top and bottom rails based on which of the available profiles we liked best and used a table saw and eventually a router to create channels within them. We also bought 1x6 pressure treated wood decking in 8 foot long lengths to create the balusters. What we've done is we've just cut it down to exactly 2 foot tall sections. And then we've got the pattern called a Lancaster baluster, and it was what was originally between the two properties. We've got that drawn out. So then how I'm approaching this is I'm, I've started basically by drilling, um, you know, the places that are really tight, that are really difficult to get with the jigsaw. So these curves I was just getting a corner at, and it works way better if I drill them and get a way nicer line. And then I'll use a smaller drill bit on each of these three holes to open up this center section. And then all of the internal corners, I've just been using a really tiny drill bit so that when I need to stop with my jigsaw, it feels different. And that's helped so much with the quality of 
the baluster. <laughs> then we used an army of jigsaws to cut out the rest of the pattern. I think we got through 15 maybe on the first weekend with five or six of us working full days. We knew we would need at least 35 balusters to be able to complete this project, so I took the rest of them home and then worked on them pretty piecemeal, doing anywhere between four and six a night on weeknights when I still had a little bit of energy left at the end of the day. You may be wondering how much time it took to complete a singular baluster, and with all of, like, the preliminary cutting, marking of the pattern, drilling, cutting out of the design, sanding painting, I would say that it probably was upwards of an hour per baluster, which is a considerable amount of time, but this was quarantine, which is unlike any time period that I've ever experienced in my life before. So while resources like money were not super plentiful, there was a lot of time and this was a pretty cheap way to do it. If you go online, you'll find Lancaster balusters on sale anywhere between like $30 and $35. We ended up installing 40 balusters. So even if they were only $30 per baluster, that would have been $1,200 per like 24 feet of fencing, which is highly expensive. Our cost for a singular piece of decking was a little over $4, I believe. And that piece was eight feet long, which meant that we could get four balusters out of that. So our price on material was just over a dollar per baluster. So yeah, math on that is like, I don't know, whatever, <laughs> what over 30, 35 is, but it's a pretty significant cost savings and is literally perfect when you have a lot of time and nothing to do. And that's how it gets started. I did cut it a little thin from this side, but it happens. All the existing ones are hand carved anyway, so you know, there's so much variance in them to begin with that it's, you know, not the end of the world if they don't all look the same. And I think when you line them up, most of the time you can't even tell, uh, which is great. I uh, ended up counting on that a lot more than I would like to, but, um, you know, got to come to terms with the fact that I can't be perfect and this can't be either, or we will be here for the next decade. I did actually check that this method was working. This is how the old balusters compared to the new at a distance. I think it's a pretty good match. Um, and even though our exact dimensions aren't the same and every baluster we're making doesn't have exactly the same dimensions, I think that's okay. Um, a, your mind kind of tricks you into believing that they all look the same. And B, we stacked a couple of the original balusters on top of each other, and there were pretty considerable discrepancies between some of what the original construction crew had made. So this made me feel loads better, and I kept reminding myself that, you know, this doesn't need to be perfect for it to be beautiful. Deep breath, wabi sabi, all that jazz. But it really helped me to stay productive and then not, like, hyper-criticalize myself throughout this process. <laughs> because I got that kind of tendency sometimes. When I was finishing with fence pieces, this is how I would lay them out because it made me feel so accomplished and it looks, in my opinion, really beautiful. Um, it was almost tempting not to paint these balusters just because I think the wood grain in them is so beautiful. However, the original house is Victorian and the porch was painted originally, which was pretty typical in the Victorian style. When I'm designing for a specific project, especially if that project has a very strong developed style, I try to take a lot of my design inspiration from that building and whatever architectural style it's constructed in, because I think it leads to a more cohesive, historically appropriate 
result. So I knew we were going to paint them despite how beautiful they look here. But this was a really wonderful thing to kind of keep the motivation up. Every time I added a couple more, the fence got longer and so rewarding. Once I finished cutting out the balusters, it became a waiting game for when the wood would be ready for the painting process. We use pressure treated wood to create the balusters because it's available, affordable, and durable. The last of which is absolutely critical for surviving PA winter. It doesn't actually just make the world hotter. It actually makes temporal extremes more extreme. <laughs> Pressure treated wood is created when lumber is sealed in a tank, the air is removed, and a chemical mixture comprised of chromium, copper, and arsenic is added. A fact that I learned editing this video. Should've done things differently. Should've worn a mask. Hmm. Anyway, the point was the vacuum forces the chemical mixture deep into the wood. The chemicals help the wood resist rot, insects, and weathering. Part of the peril of this process is that the lumber is understandably quite wet following a two-day chemical spa treatment. As a result, it either needs to be sealed with a specialized product post-install or treated following a several months long drying period. We prop the balusters up and left them outside for six, maybe seven months at least. During this time, this is how I decorated our driveway. Pressure treated lumber is ready for finishing when the surface absorbs water instead of repelling it. When I say repelling it, I mean it really just like kind of bubbles on the surface. Eventually we got tired of bleeding and learned that when we sanded it, the water absorbs. Real talk, does anyone else hate the prep work as much as we do? It is like the most monotonous, time consuming, thankless part of any project. So it does yield the best results! My mom and I sanded the balusters, I used this rotary tool I got for Christmas to sand the majority of the wood cutouts, and then we hand sanded anything that we couldn't hit with the tools. You know what? I like this process so little, I don't even want to watch it. Next, please. I got this nifty paint sprayer at the Walmart because they had the cheapest one. This part of the project was incredibly gratifying. The pieces look so much better with proper prep and a new coat of paint. We chose a two-in-one paint and primer in white to mimic the original cream of the porch. It's definitely the fastest way to paint these. But in a way that matched the white of the existing windows. We did two coats of this paint on each side of every element. I should mention that there are some people who say never to paint pressure treated lumber, that it doesn't adhere well, waste of time, energy, resources, whatever. Obviously, I do not fall into that category. I did research this first and found that in general, if the lumber is dried and absorbing water, the paints failing should not be an issue. On another note, we also painted the original fence at this time, which we had already stripped and wet sanded. Because, you know, you really can't add too many steps to a process, can you? At this point in time, our team as a whole had to have spent several weeks worth of work making the fence pieces, which led up to this incredibly confident moment. Today we are installing all of the new fence that has been recreated to match the existing. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be such a day of transformation, just putting all these pieces together that we've worked on for so long. I'm really excited to see how it's going to turn out, but I also feel pretty nervous um, just because we put so many man hours into this project and 
you know, it's not just been me, it's been everyone who believes in the project. And everyone wants to see it, um, wants to see it come together and see this beautiful thing that they've made. Um, but it's also, you know, nerve wracking because then there's this, in some ways, audience and what if we make, you know, a mistake and cut something too short and, you know, what if we have a problem? What if it doesn't go together, you know, like I think it will because it's kind of an odd construction for a fence. So there's so many exciting things, but also there's definitely some nervous energy. We got this. I hope. So this is the post of the original railing. We measured from the bottom of it where it meets the deck to the top of the railing. And then we used that measurement and we transferred it over here to our new posts where our new railing is gonna go. And we've got the height marked and we've got the center line marked. We measured the height of the fence and determined where the bottom rail should be. We cut the rail to size, placed it in position and attached them to the structure with stainless steel L brackets. I was so worried that I'd mess something up so badly that we couldn't complete install that day, which was a little bit silly because I literally knew how to make every single piece of the railing, but was also somewhat of a valid concern because I did screw up part of this installation. <laughs> Let me know if you can spot where I went wrong. I also think that insecurity may have been heavily influenced by pandemic stress. I think this was around the time that I kept hearing the Watch the breakdown lyric from Drake's Nice for what every time something worse happened and I wanted to break down uh, healthy, but apparently I've moved on from this hyper emotional phase of the pandemic and into the nonstop creatively distracted one. We're coping. Anyway, let's get back to the actual thing we're supposed to be doing. My mama jury rigged this beautiful elastic band to hold the balusters in. We centered a baluster along the main fence piece and rough fitted the rest of the balusters around it. Oh, it looks so good. We were so happy we dropped them all. <laughs> we started over again and I used a nailer gun to attach the balusters better. This basically just kept them from blowing over in the wind. I added flat pieces to fill out the gaps at each end. Again, I stole this idea from the original fence. Once the center section was together, we fitted the top. It needed to be routed a little bit wider um, just to get it to fit on all of the balusters at once. And then it slid into place. We screwed it into both the columns and into the top of a couple of the balusters. And that was one done! Two of the Kennedy ladies joined us and then we did it all again and again for the next two sections of fencing. Technically, no fencing was required because the height of the deck is elevated less than 18 inches above the ground. However, our architect recommended we add perimeter fencing as a best practice and to bring the building closer to modern day building code. It would have been impossible to meet building code 100% without damaging the historic fabric of the building. For example, our fence is an inch or two shorter than the minimum height specified for modern fencing. This is because installing a fence to the minimum required height would have meant damaging the column detailing to meet a standard that was not required to be met in this situation. Modern fences are also required to have a maximum length of six feet between posts. Here again, we match the historic fencing as opposed to code because code was not required to be met in this specific instance. Practically, this was a bit annoying because they only sold top and bottom rails in six foot lengths because they didn't want you to go in longer than six foot lengths. I ended up cutting these members on a 45 degree angle and joining them with a slice plate. On install, I made sure the splices were on opposite ends, but I still think this design element led to a little bit of sag in the end. If I did do this project again, I would get a piece of wood that would span the full length and route it to a profile I liked, but at the time I didn't have the knowledge the tool or the confidence. So again, more lessons learned. Sean and I bolted this half post to the wall. We used masonry anchors and just basically attached them. However, the instructions on the back of the anchor pack said to. Once this half post was in place, we could get on with installing the third and only original section of fencing. Oh, oh boy. It didn't fit.
This was by far the most finicky section of fence to actually refit into place for a couple of reasons. A, the wood was like old and just fairly inconsistent. B, we had to actually switch out four out of the 15 balusters so they weren't all the same. We spaced the new ones evenly across this. I think like every like three balusters or something like that. On the bright side, they look so good you can't tell them apart unless of course you measure them. In which case, the new ones are half an inch skinnier, or if you look at the corners on the new pieces, which are slightly rounded instead of straight, but nobody knows about that. Um, but yeah, this one was just took a lot of effort to get like all of the pieces to fit together and fit together well. I think we were also down to like the last couple pieces and there was more warping in them, but we didn't want to remove any of the originals from the building more than we had to, so we just kind of took our time with this one. Thankfully, my mother is a wood whisperer, so we got there in the end. It just took a little more effort than the other ones. What happened was I was cleaning up the wood here and I was organizing it, and I was like, why are there these extra pieces of wood? It makes no sense, why would I buy these if we're not using them? And I couldn't figure out what I bought them before. And then I built the old fence, and I realized, oh, they were supposed to have a bottom part supporting them in the original design. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what these extra that's pieces of wood are. So do we have to rip out the whole No, top? no. So I think in theory, what I totally forgot. Yeah. Oops. Show me. <laughs> okay. So yeah. Based on that clip, I forgot part of the instructions that I myself wrote. The first thing that we did was take the missing piece out to the front yard and make sure we liked the actual look of it when attached to the fence. We decided that we did like this original design element, so we sanded it, painted it, and then I rip cut along the length of the member to reduce the 4 inch dimension of the 2x4. Installation was fairly straightforward. We started by clamping the member to the base of the fence and making sure it was centered. And then we were having this particular issue. I understand the madness. I don't understand the method. Where there was just like a little bit of sag, and therefore the entire like fence was dipping down, particularly on this center front section. What, what are you doing? Breaking things. Um, can I say no? Isn't <laughs> that my job today? Breaking things? So what we decided to do was to steal a technique from structural concrete design. When horizontal concrete members are designed to take heavy loads, sometimes they are pre-stressed to counteract that downward force. An example would be a beam member which will support a bridge deck. The concrete is pre-stressed by installing and tightening steel cables prior to the pouring of concrete around it. This configuration applies pressure to the concrete, making it curve upwards to form a slight hill instead of a perfectly straight member. When the weight of the bridge deck is added to the member, the member displaces downward to form a relatively flat line, as opposed to curving downwards from a flat line into a smiley face shape. This helps prevent the concrete from cracking, which happens when it is stretched in the smiley shape. That was a tangent. Anyway, I used this idea in a super simplified form when installing the missing member. I jacked it into a hill-like position to counteract the existing sag in the member and attach the new member to the base of the fence and posts with screws. Once it was fully anchored, I removed the pressure from the car jack and let the fence settle into place. Then I did the whole thing over again with the shorter length of fencing. Generally, this worked pretty well. It worked better on the shorter span than the longer, but that's to be expected as the longer a member is, the more it will displace when loaded. But the result was improved and therefore I was happy with it. Okay, you're good to place that. Uh, now where is our fresh putty? Fresh putty? There we go. Is this fresh? Yeah, yeah I just think this needs to be filled in a little more. There was kind of a weird gap and then where, where Allison beat up the wood because she was frustrated. She made a little extra. I did not. Beat Actually, I might have. I don't know why. <laughs> you can get oh, it. It's like the melting marker is. You gotta start more. Well, the green inside looks amazing. Any glitches? Yeah, there's probably still some more touch ups to be done, but. Cool. Uh, it looks pretty good, though. 
Yeah, you can go back to doing every other now. And just one. Yeah. It doesn't need that much, but like this like area is clearly flexing a little bit. Great for it. I don't need much more. Like watch out. A favorite She's... job for you guys. Jeez. I don't know. We really like the masonry too. Yeah. Feeling <laughs> that we like the gloopy gloss. <laughs> <laughs> it's like playing with a uh, play doh or something. I don't yeah. Know. Liquid sand. <laughs> Is it bad luck to clock under a ladder? Yes. I'm almost done here, I swear. You didn't even flinch at that. <laughs> yeah, okay, well, I might finish before we're done. You can just hang on the railing, right? Are you supposed to? I'll just stand on the railing, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> don't you have a harness in the car? I don't have any Not in this car. Yeah, we could maybe get something done. I know, seriously. Can I move that? Yeah, oh, so just guys... one more step. Would you guys stop? You would get things quick. How is there dog hair here? Not the ceiling. <laughs> when Dexter walks on the ceiling, he gets up. He gets there. Yeah. If you enjoyed this adventure, please locate and engage your nearest like button. And don't forget to join us next time for the newest episode of Fabricating Chaos. Will we tear apart serviceable sportswear? Will we recreate pilfered woodwork? We honestly don't know. I am going to go now, but I will leave you with this lovely little clip of us sanding. Please enjoy and goodbye. Yeah, this is perfectly normal. Later <laughs> one, Erin comes down to the aisle. Oh, okay. I like that one. That was my favorite. Thank you so much. Thank you for sanding while I'm...